warmth, and I always wanted to do a, a horror film set in a cave. It's the, it's the classic environment, and it, it, you know, horror films are best set in the dark, and you can't get any more dark than this. Six feisty, uh, fearless women who are all friends and share a passion for climbing and the outdoors. <laughs> One weekend, they go on an adventure together down a cave. Here's to our adventure. As they descend further and further into this cave, uh, things start to go drastically wrong. They get lost amongst this sort of labyrinth of tunnels. And this is where we found out that not only are we in the wrong cave, we are in a cave that nobody knows about. And you see the fracture of the friendships and the fracture of minds. What it is about is uh, descent into madness and uh, physical descent into the depths of the earth. And just when they think things can't go more wrong, they can. I just saw something ahead in the tunnel. <laughs> Discover that they're not the only people in the cave, there's something else. These other beings that don't really want them to survive. And we still haven't figured out which way's out. Run! Don't tell anyone, but the dark scares me. I'm so cool. <laughs> things going towards my eyes or things being put in my eyes frightens the life out of me. When I was reading the script for, uh, for this film, I, was, uh, I read it in the summer. I was laying in the garden, beautiful sunshine, wearing my sunglasses, got to halfway through the script, hairs were going up on the back of my neck, and I had to go inside and stop reading the script. Good God. Squish them through. <laughs> it's unbelievable. What scares me? Wasps scare me. <laughs> I'm not really afraid of anything physical. I'm not I'm not afraid of heights really. I'm not afraid of spiders or anything like that. Spiders and women and spider women. Get that. <laughs> I think anything that's set in a house scares me the most because I'm in a house. If I saw this film, it would be okay because I don't generally go caving. Or even the Blair Witch Project, I don't generally go camping, so I can deal with it. But anything where there's things in a house, I freak out. Horror films are a lot of fun to make and a lot of fun to watch audiences watching. <laughs> you can hear the fear. You, know, you can hear the gasps, you can hear the, the jumps and the screams and the laughs and all that kind of stuff that you get when you're watching a horror film. It's a very audible reaction that you get. I actually went to the cinema uh, a few nights ago with, with Neil and Sam, the uh, director of photography, and we went to go and see uh, The Grudge, which is a great, great movie, and they were sitting either side of me and loving it, and I was just avoiding it, and I was, oh, my goodness, and Neil kept on poking me because I was shaking. Jaws would be... Probably my favourite horror. American Werewolf in London, because I, I watched that as a, a kid and just thought that is tremendous. Boringly, The Shining. It's one of my favourite films, so The Shining, without a doubt. <laughs> I've thought about it for the last three days, and I still can't come up with a definite one. Be the thing, which was pure. Spectacle or prosthetics. Evil Dead 2. It's probably completely not objective, but it's definitely dog soldiers. <laughs> yes, yeah. What's your favourite? Because I don't watch it. What's your favourite horror films? Yeah. Oh, my, my favourite horror films and the films that have inspired this more than any other, I'd, I'd have to say Deliverance, uh, which, although isn't technically a horror film, is pretty scary. Alien and The Shining each dealing with, with, with aspects of this film in different ways. Shining about somebody going insane. No! Alien about atmosphere and menace and dark spaces and deliverance about the idea of an adventure trip that goes wrong.
It's so inspiring how much love and passion he has for film, and especially horror. When he talks about it, he becomes like a little boy just talking about the gore. <laughs> Put the shits right up the audience's eyes. <laughs> he finds them hysterical, really funny, and I just went, oh, that's a different way of looking at it. And Mark! <laughs> Cut there. Cut there. Super. <laughs> I think it must be a, a dark streak running through me, but I just love scaring the pants off people. <laughs> Ever since we um, conceived this script idea, there's, there's been a kind of running joke that this film is six chicks with picks. <laughs> I'd seen Dog Soldiers and I loved it and I wanted to work with Neil. And once I'd read the script, I just thought it was interesting to have an all-female cast. <laughs> Which in an action horror film was quite unique. Seven weeks, really intense filming, all female. And I thought, oh, well, this is going to, this is going to be interesting. <laughs> I confess that um, I, I went into it cautiously, having worked with a you know, pretty much all male uh, ensemble cast on Dog Soldiers. But at the end, we've managed to achieve that same atmosphere of collaboration and a good sense of fun, but also a good sense of professionalism, and everybody's just mugging in. You know, to be honest with you, it's such an ensemble thing, you know, cast and crew together. So much of the crew's male, so it balances it out. <laughs> I think you do. <laughs> I think it's the crew are brilliant, absolutely wonderful, and, and that's working really nicely and, and having a great time with them. <laughs> Look at this bunch of tosses. <laughs> no, 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 It's no. just really like having your, your little guy with you the whole time. No, 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 no. Because <laughs> we are very friendly. We, we had to bond really quickly. We were doing climbing. Uh, the first week of knowing each other, where you're holding the rope and you're basically, you know, your friends up there on a wall, your friend you've known for half an hour is up on the wall and, you, and you've got her life in your hands. We learnt basic climbing techniques and how to abseil and use a harness and rig up ropes, which is really, really exciting. <laughs> I went down with them and did my first bit of abseiling and things like that, I don't know waterfall, and it was great. Uh, but it's not something as it was a pastime. And we did a lot of research. Uh, we went caving um, to, to various caves in, in the UK to try and get stuck in tiny small spaces and to be in, in, in awe of the, of the huge spaces. Oh my God. <laughs> we went caving in Derbyshire. Uh, it was really good fun, just kind of getting used to all the equipment. Doing a lot of upper strength exercises, a lot of pull-ups and hanging there for a bit, which creates massive respect from, from guys in the gym, I can tell you. I was actually saying to one of the girls on set, you know, it's you knowing how to grab parts of the wall. Um, I'm so glad that we had that training because it's you could feel quite clumsy and it is quite dangerous. As long as I look up, I'm fine. Just don't look down. <laughs> so we did a course of climbing, we did whitewater rafting training. Did you enjoy it? We went real caving underground and just generally kept fit. This isn't a film production at all. It's actually a subverse training program for the CIA. <laughs> <laughs> For my character, I had to, obviously, I had to chop my hair off. I was down up there. It was a bit traumatic for the first week or two, but it's cool. I didn't really prepare mentally. I just prepared what I thought the, the journey of the character was going to be, and it's quite dramatic, the change she goes through. It's, it's almost a full... It's not really a full circle, it's more of a spiral. Almost always when I do, when I start working on a character, I start writing a diary as the character. So one thing which for me was very important with Rebecca is very, very, very safety. Safety first, so 
always look around and see which things could possibly be dangerous. See, how, how are people around you doing? Do they look like they could be flipping out or not? You know, I have done this before, you know. I'm only looking after you. And I appreciate it in small doses. So to get into that thing and make it natural, kind of spend a few days, a few weeks, really annoying your friends going, just checking them out the whole time. Don't try and justify this. Well, what do you mean? Well, what does she mean? Oh, wait a minute. You filed a flight plan with Mountain West. If we don't report in, they'll just come looking for us. Yeah, that's how it's supposed to work, except I filed a plan for Borum Caverns, and this is not Borum Caverns, it's a Juno. Well, these girls are, are game for anything, and, and you know, on screen, they're just mind-blowing. They're a really, really solid bunch, and it's been a dream to work with them. He knows these movies big time, and I'm a complete nerd when it comes to movies, so <laughs> it's been good. This is Russell Crowe, apparently. He sets a great example, showing people that you don't have to shout or be forceful in order to get the work done. Because, you know, it's, it's, it, some of the scenes are really quite horrific, and you've got to, to make them believable, you've actually got to be experiencing these emotions. And he's been really patient and, um, always giving us space. Encourages coming to set with an open mind about things, even in terms of the dialogue. And sometimes I find that frustrating. Um, in other situations, I find it frustrating when you get new lines on the day, or why don't we try it completely different to how it's written. But in this experience, it's been really enlightening, actually, and lots of fun. Yes, yeah, Shona, whatever you say, whatever you say, OK. <laughs> Close up, OK. Good. It's not improvising. It's maybe a bit more ad-libbing, but it's sort of thinking of all the possibilities you could play the scene in. He's very collaborative, absolutely knows what he wants, but is confident enough, I guess, in his abilities to actually, um, you know, take the best of everybody's contributions. I remember him saying that he wasn't interested in us playing one-dimensional characters. Come on, Jesse, it's freezing. Let's go back to the car. And I think in horror, it's very easy to do that because, you know, horror can easily be very uh, rely heavily on on a formula and he really allowed us to you know flesh these characters out give them lots of different levels give them a backstory and we really worked hard on those backstories so i think we would have taken the normal safety procedures and and kind of worked out roughly what the the, the route is and i think if paul is there he's also he also could be there because they have had an affair there's there's all that other stuff that yeah, I don't know, that's just, I, I always read it, that's how it was. Um, I first drafted the script was a lot more sort of caricatured, that the, 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 the women were a bit more sort of stylized and slightly unrealistic. You know, the, the script is relentlessly linear in terms of, you know, we never revisit anything, it just keeps moving straight forward, and I think the environment through which the characters move has stayed pretty much the same. The action hasn't really changed at all, the actual story progression and the physical action you know, that happens within it hasn't changed at all, at all. Draft one, there was a cave entrance and they abseiled down and then they went down the, uh, uh, the sink, the, um, what's it called? I can't remember what it's called. And that's down the pipe. Yeah, well, I can't remember what that space is called, but they move through the, basically exactly the same physical spaces in the first draft as they're going to in the film. Yeah. The other side. Yeah, you come up, hand on the rock, right hand on the rock, you know, look to where Sarah's yeah. gone, which is, which is gone. And then you hear the screaming behind you, so then roll back over again to that side, look right there, and then haul yourself out and take yourself back. But the characters have, have just gone from strength to strength and become much more real and more human. And it's just been a question of just adding layers to them. I call it the flaky pastry principle. And I find it oh, yeah, so fantastic that we can explore uh, those metaphors in such a um, <laughs> tactile way. I, I think that is something that is missing from a lot of art nowadays. For me, as an Asian actor, one of the key things was that it wasn't written as an Asian character. It was an opportunity for me to play a really well thought out character, which was very full. Um, Sarah, I haven't had a chance to say that I'm really sorry I didn't stay around longer after the accident. And that, for any actor, is like a real blessing. You don't come across those sorts of characters very often. Each character has some kind of a highlight moment. And, and of those moments, I love it when uh, the character of Holly gets angry. And she starts off as very happy-go-lucky, and then at a certain point, she gets angry and she flares up. Don't try and pin this fucking shit on me! Ah, it's really, really fun to play. And 
she dies horribly. <laughs> I'm not, okay, I shouldn't really say that, should I? Well, I love the fact uh, that Sarah and Juno go a little bit mental, and when they get into the physical action, things go, get pretty interesting there. <laughs> From its original conception, I envisioned this film as being very, very dark, both in tone and, you know, in visual style, which is um, to make it as dark as possible. When you think it's dark when you turn out the lights, well, down there, it's pitch black. Neil's produced a beautiful script that, uh, that really helped. It was very easy to, to see the kind of the flow of um, the spaces, the caves, large, big, huge spaces, and uh, going down to little tiny spaces. And what's great on the set is that you can actually allow yourself to sort of um, give life to that panic that, you know, you do feel, because you, if you're in an enclosed space, you do feel that claustrophobia and you do feel that fear. But when you're actually in a caving situation, you can't really give life to that fear because being panicked, obviously, is hugely dangerous. Action. Oh. Whoa. <coughs> it's something where if you start thinking about it, it's freaky, so you just don't. Because you know that if you, would, if you would think about it, if you think about masses and masses and masses of bricks all over you, you go a bit mad, but just kind of don't. Quite a few members of the crew are claustrophobic, and they've been shuddering when they go on onto some of the stages and see the spaces that the, uh, the actresses have to crawl through. My boobs going to fit. It was a challenge because I had to sort of uh, concentrate on breathing when we were doing the caving. Action! <laughs> I'm a big sissy. I, I can get my head around most things. The dark does scare me because I've got quite a vivid imagination. I just want to ask you about the vagina. Sorry, I mean cave. Are you <laughs> impressed with it? <laughs> does it? Does it conform to your um, specifications? It's a lovely, tight crack. What can I say? <laughs> Tomorrow morning at 6 o'clock, the, um, the slime is arriving uh, to uh, lubricate the, uh, the cave with. Seriously? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> what do you think of the vagina? The vagina is fantastic. Tell me what your line is in this scene. What, going through the large vagina? Yeah. <laughs> I get to yell, um, <laughs> what is it? Oh yeah, it's a, it's a tight crack, but I can make it. What I love about this kind of stuff is that you just you just kind of throw this stuff at it. You just like come up with these daft ideas. You put them in this, and people can just like read whatever they want into it. That's like, be There's my quite guest. There's a lot to read into it. Fine, be my guest. It's just there. Do you, know. you mind if you've got? Sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want there to be any like real gratuitous light sources in this in this caves. I mean, it's, it's proving a problem as we're filming it. To suddenly think, well, how are we actually going to light this scene? Because they've only got, you know, a box of matches on them. So, right, well, we, we use a box of matches. I don't know how we're going to do it, but we use a box of matches. <laughs> Toward the end of the film, though, with the, they start thing, setting things on fire and it gets a bit easier for us. We had a few different ways of, of creating the caves. Some of them were moulded, so we took moulds from real um, existing cliff faces, like the one behind me, uh, which was a, a real hard slate structure. And other, other caves were more dribbly, kind of with stalactites, kind of with calcium deposits. We've got a little, um, dressed in little wax stalactites, um, so when the girl's coming in, they're showing their torch around the space, the little uh, wax stalactites backlight, and they should light up nicely. We used the same material, same foam, uh, uh, spray. We just used it in different ways. You actually have to kind of see them to believe them because they're these really realistic caves and alcoves and and tunnels which suddenly open up into these huge sort of rooms filled with the most amazing stone architecture and it's all a form of polystyrene which is just mind-blowing. Simon's done a fantastic job with the production design. But we do have a problem of not simply ha not having enough money to, to um, make the set stretch throughout the whole story. So we were looking at building a very expensive tank uh, made of metal and big and robust, and people were talking about how many gallons and tonnes of water it was going to take. So uh, to make it simple, I just said, well, we should shoot it in a bath. 
created a system where we're revamping the caves. So we're only basically building six caves, but changing the look through color and uh, texture, so adding um, stalactites, maybe making them one of them wet, one of them very dry and dusty. So we're hopefully fooling the audience into thinking that the cave system is much bigger than what we're actually building. Yes, we've reused the wall, um, the back wall. On the entrance chamber, it was, it was very kind of flat and all striations and the rock were very horizontal. And then for the um, cathedral cavern, we've hoisted up uh, that side. Um, eight foot to give it to make the striations run diagonally to hopefully change the look of it. Also on the, on the entrance chamber we had lots of plants growing on it and water pouring down it. The, the cathedral cavern was very dry. This time it's very wet. Uh, we covered it in lots of um, uh, stalactites um, to, to change the look of it. It's great to work with because although you're surrounded by crew and cameras on, either, on sort of several sides, you can sort of just turn your face slightly and it's as if you're actually in a real cave and you get the same sense of claustrophobia that you get when you're caving. For the Bone Dam set, we had uh, only, I think, four days to revamp it from, from one set, which was the cathedral cavern, to the, uh, to the Bone Dam. All right, now we can start again. It involved basically laying down a 50-foot square tank. I wanted the set to be very wet, so there's, a, there's like a one-inch tank of water. Uh, covering the floor and applying all these big stalactite structures um, and these big columns kind of lo looking like it's made of a calcium deposit of some sort. It's really weird and you're not really sure if the, the towers are made of bones themselves. And then we had 500 bones made uh, dressed in around the floor as if they'd been washed up against the, um, uh, the structures. It looked pretty good. It's big. Action! done a sterling job in, in ripping sets apart and putting them back together in a different order to make it a new set and that's that's sort of become a slight challenge now but because they're so good at what they do it's not that much of a problem for me. 5p rule. What that, what's that? Preparation prevents piss poor performance. If we'd have had more um, more monies, let's say, uh, we could have done a few shots differently. We've built big sets on this on this production, but there are some shots that we could have uh, gone further back and back and back and seen a huge, amazing space. We are extending some of the sets um, using uh, visual effects, so we're doing matte paintings to, to make them feel larger than they really are. But it would have been nice to have built bigger sets. Next time. We're doing all the creatures, the and the human oh, beings, the all the same bunch of parts, the, the thousand bones that we manufactured, all the prosthetic violence towards the humans. Oh, really? All the dead animals, two goats, two sheep, two cows, giant elk. I made this last night, pretty much overnight, whipped it up, carved it from a tree. Neil wanted maggots on uh, the giant dead elk we made. I have an absolute phobia against maggots, and that's one reason I didn't go to Scotland to film the giant dead, dead elk scene, is just because I just can't deal with being anywhere near maggots. A bit icky. Don't touch it. You wouldn't want to pick it off. <laughs> what do you think did that, Sam? A bear? What is it? Nature detectives? Could have been Bigfoot for all you know. Come on. Stop probing it with a fucking stick. Seeing how uh, the prosthetics guys work, and that is incredible. I didn't realize how much time and effort goes into that. <laughs> Human prosthetics, basically, um, all the girls get something, apart from Sarah. Before we started filming, I came in and I did a full body cast. Um, they just put it in mold and just made a full prosthetic of my body for, obviously, when I'm dead and throwing me down a, a pit. In there is mascara, not eyelashes. <laughs>